Good evening and welcome to this, the fourth session in our series on Greek history and civilization, about 700 BC to 500 AD. You'll see that we have a long way to go until we get to 500 AD, and we're already on session number four, and we've only just reached the year 480 BC, so there's another 900 years of Greek history left to cover. However, this is a set of events of the utmost importance, not only for Greek history, but for our own history. And it would be a criminal dereliction of duty if I were to pass over the Persian Wars with a brief mention. This cover slide is another of my artificial intelligence masterpieces. I wanted a representation of Xerxes, standing on the shores of the Hellespont, looking across the straits from Asia into Europe. And it seems that chat GPT did me proud, except for that man in the bottom right who appears to have a blue nose. But apart from that, it's quite a good image. And something like this surely happened. Xerxes did stand on the shores of the Hellespont, he did look across the Straits into Europe, and he did cross from the Straits into Europe. So that image being described, let's move to the Dramatis Personae. And I think I said last week that this is the first war where we can look at representations of the main participants. We can also read their own words. There on the left, you have King Xerxes, King Xerxes the Great, the son of Darius the Great, the man who undertook to complete his father's conquest of Greece. Next to him, you have Themistocles, the great Athenian naval strategist and politician, the man who perhaps did more than anybody else to stop the Persian invasion, to his right, you have possibly Leonidas, one of the kings of Sparta. This may not be a statue of him, but it's the best I could find. And then on the right, you have Pausanias, a Spartan general, the man who finished off the Persian invasion in 479. So those are the most important people in our story, or rather, those are the most famous people in our story. Let me review where we're at. This is the Persian Empire at its greatest extent, the greatest empire that had, until that time, ever existed. And it was, throughout its history, expansive, always looking for new territories to conquer. You'll see that the Persians have already crossed into Europe, their dominions stretch up towards the river Danube, and they stretch deep to the west, taking in Macedon and northern Greece. The Persians would like to conquer Greece. They would like to conquer Greece for a number of reasons. The first reason is because it's there. It is a staging post on their further expansion west. Another reason they'd like to conquer the Greeks is because they're always at war with each other. And as I said last week, if you're running a great empire, you don't want a set of excitable neighbours on one of your distant frontiers always going to war with each other because the resulting chaos may or indeed will spread to your own dominions. Another reason why the Persians wanted to conquer Greece was because when the Greek city-states along the western shores of Asia revolted against the Persians in 500 BC, these rebels were given substantial material support by some of the independent Greek city-states, chiefly Athens. It is because of Athenian help that the rebellious Greeks were able to march on Sardis, the provincial capital, and even if by accident they did burn it to the ground, Darius was outraged. This was an affront to his imperial dignity. He resolved to deal as gently as he needed with his own rebellious subjects, 
but to deal very harshly indeed with the Athenians and with anybody else who had assisted them. And so an invasion of Greece was to do with the expansion of Persian power throughout the world and also to do with punishing a most irritating minor power on the edge of the world. However, Darius sent a brief punitive expedition which landed at Marathon and was unexpectedly repelled by the Athenians, the Athenians all by themselves. Darius was not greatly put out by this. He resolved simply to come back with greater forces, but then rebellions broke out elsewhere in the Persian Empire. He spent the next few years putting these down, and while campaigning, he died. There was then a brief power struggle until one of his sons, Xerxes, took over. He then had to deal with the continuing unrest within the Persian Empire, in Egypt and in Babylonia. And it was not until 481, nine years after Marathon, that Xerxes was finally able to call a great council of his nobles to the capital Persepolis and to outline his plans of what to do with the Greeks. And there's another artificial intelligence representation of Xerxes getting ready to address his council. When Xerxes opened the council, he allowed his nobles complete freedom of speech. He didn't expect people to grovel on their bellies while he told them what he was going to do. He would, in due course, tell them what he was going to do. But before then, he allowed anybody to have his say. And one of his uncles did suggest that this might not be a wonderful idea. The conference or the council was opened by the brother-in-law of Xerxes, Mardonius, the man who had swept through the Greek city-states on the western coast of Asia some years ago, trying to pacify them with promises of lower taxation and the granting of local democratic autonomy. Mardonius opened the council with a fine speech saying that the conquest of the Greek city-states was unfinished business and it should be dealt with as quickly as possible. Another of Xerxes' relatives, one of his uncles, then said, I'm not too sure about this. The Greeks do have a certain advantage to fighting on land, especially on rocky terrain, where we can't get horses to surround them and shoot arrows at them. The Greeks have better discipline, they have better armour, they'll be fighting for their own country, and they'll be fighting on home territory. Do bear in mind the very long supply lines to keep an army in the field in Greece, and do bear in mind as well that we don't have reliable maps. We don't know Greece very well. We shall be moving into pretty well unknown territory, and do bear in mind as well that the last time we tried to invade, we got a bloody nose. Xerxes wasn't terribly pleased by this. He was not at all pleased, and his speech was a resolution that there would be an invasion of Greece. And these are his words as reported by Herodotus, may not be completely reliable, but this is probably more or less what he said. It is the manifest destiny of Persia to rule the world. From the time that Cyrus first commenced the work of conquest by subduing media to the present day, the extent of our empire has been continually widening until it now covers all of Asia and Africa, with the exception of the remote and barbarous tribes that, like the wild beasts which share their forests with them, are not worth the trouble of subduing. These vast conquests have been made by the courage, the energy, and the military power of Cyrus, Darius, and Cambyses, my renowned predecessors. So he continues, his father Darius did intend to conquer Greece, but he died unfortunately before he could set to work. 
and Xerxes feels that it is a matter of filial piety to undertake this invasion. He then continues, not just with explanations of manifest destiny, but more pressing reasons. You all remember the unprovoked and wanton aggression which the Athenians committed against us in the time of the great Ionian rebellion, taking part against us with rebels and enemies mentions the burning of Sardis. I will never rest until I've had my revenge by burning Athens. Remember that, he wants to burn Athens. Many of you too who are here present remember the fate of our expedition under Datis. Those of you who were attached to that expedition will have no need that I should urge you to seek revenge for your own wrong. My plan for gaining access to the Grecian territories is not, as before, to convey the troops on a fleet of galleys over the Aegean Sea, but to build a bridge across the Hellespont and march the army to Greece by land. This course, which I am well convinced is practicable, will be more safe than the other, and the bridging of the Hellespont will of itself be a glorious deed. The Greeks will be utterly unable to resist the enormous force which we shall have been able to pour upon them. Herodotus comments, Such was in substance the address of Xerxes to his council. He concluded by saying that it was not his wish to act in the affair in an arbitrary or absolute manner, and he invited all present to express with perfect freedom any opinions or views which they entertained in respect of the enterprise, and that was it. The whole thing was decided. Xerxes announced, we are going to invade Greece, and he sent all of his nobles away to the various parts of the empire that they ruled under his supervision, so that they could raise contingents of troops and masses of necessary war material. Xerxes would assemble the greatest army the world had ever seen. He would march it across the sea, not ferry it in boats, he would march it across the Hellespont, and he would burst into Greece, and the Greeks would quail at the very mention of his name. Such was the plan. For the next year, there were frantic preparations all over the Persian Empire. According to Herodotus, and you can't trust the figures given by Herodotus, though if you divide them by ten, they become conceivable, which suggests that somewhere along the way, the translation of Persian into Greek numbers was slightly garbled. But according to Herodotus, 49 nations of more than 5 million men, 1.7 million of whom were able-bodied foot soldiers, and 80,000 horsemen were assembled. And most formidable of all the Persian forces were those men in the image there on the right, the 10,000 immortals, the best trained, the bravest, the hardest fighting of all the Persian armies, 10,000 men hand-picked and trained, called immortals because as soon as one fell in battle, he was replaced. And so the individual parts of the army were as mortal as the rest of us, but the army itself was mortal. To set out from Sardis, the provincial capital in the west, he headed up along a road towards the straits that separate Asia from Europe. He arrived at the straits. He arrived at a place called Abydos, and Herodotus records... At Abydos, Xerxes now decided to hold a review of his army. On a rise of ground nearby, a throne of white marble had already been specially prepared for his use by the people of Abydos. So the king took his seat upon it, and looking down upon the shore was able to see the whole of his army and navy in a single view. And when he saw the whole Hellespont hidden by ships, and all the beaches and plains filled with men, he called himself happy, and the moment after burst into tears. Artabanus, his uncle, the man who hadn't been too happy about the expedition, was by his side, and when he saw how Xerxes wept, he said to him, 
My lord, surely there is a strange contradiction in what you do now and what you did a moment ago. Then you called yourself a happy man, and now you weep. I was thinking, Xerxes replied, and it came into my mind how pitifully short human life is, for of all these thousands of men, not one will be alive in a hundred years' time. Indeed, many of them would not be alive in a year's time, but that was in the future. Something that you get from the history of Herodotus is the rather scary but still human nature of Xerxes. He comes across as a rather tragic hero. He is a man consumed by pride, and pride drives him to an enterprise which at first seems eminently performable, but which gradually falls to pieces because the gods are not on his side. You often do feel sorry for Xerxes, even when you are astonished or shocked by his casual brutality and his arbitrary manners. And there is a representation of Xerxes inspecting his army and navy from his white throne above the Hellespont. Quite a nice one. You can always trust ChatGPT to do you proud if you ask it nicely. Let's come back to the plan of attack. So the map on the left shows the line of march from Sardis where the army was brought together up towards the straits. And the idea was to cross over the straits by a bridge that I've mentioned and then to march along the land all the way through Macedon, down through northern and central Greece, to make a lunge at Attica and to Athens, to burn Athens, to take Athens, and then to wait for the remaining Greek city-states to come to their senses and to send gifts of earth and water. And all this time, a gigantic Persian fleet would be sailing along the coast, keeping the Persian army supplied as best it could with food, and also taking orders, reporting information, and generally doing the things that a fleet does in a combined land and naval operation. At the same time, if you look at the bottom right of this map, you'll see an arrow coming up from the southeast. These would be the Phoenician navies from Tyre and Sidon, which would join with the Persian fleet and provide an overwhelming naval presence in the Mediterranean that would stop the Greeks from so much as floating a plank on their own waters. This would be an overpoweringly large invasion. Herodotus reports that as the Persians advanced, they drank the very streams dry. Various ancient figures... Herodotus records five million men. Other historians record three million men. It is very difficult to get an army of that size together, even nowadays. If you divide those figures by ten, it does become conceivable. Let's imagine that Xerxes was leading an army of between 300 and 500,000 men, plus a long baggage train, through that rather rocky country in Thrace, into Macedonia and northern Greece. It would still have been the largest army that we know of that was ever assembled up to that time. It would have been an impressive and a terrifying force. However, it has one very, very serious problem, a potential defect, let's say. Greece has never been a particularly fertile country. It's never been a country abundant in food and water. The Persians needed to bring a great deal of their own food with them. They would not be able to support an army of that size by foraging. They could strip the Greeks they passed of everything they had and leave them to starve it still wouldn't be enough to keep an army of between three 
and 500,000 men fed and watered. And although there was a large Persian fleet, these ships were not large enough to supply an army of that size with anything near the amount of food it needed. So when Xerxes set out across the Straits into Europe, he was working to a very strict timetable. He had to be in certain places before certain times. If there was any substantial delay in that timetable, the invasion would fail. This is not something that was generally known at the time. Some people understood it, but many people didn't. Herodotus himself doesn't appear completely to have understood the logistical constraints of the invasion, but this is the weakness. If you try meeting this vast combined army and navy in open battle, you will lose because they will roll over you. But their weakness is that they must get the job done and get out again within a limited time. Otherwise, they will run out of food and then the whole invasion will collapse. That is the weakness. And that is a weakness which is not evidenced in the contemporary histories of the invasion, but it is a weakness that some of the Athenians understood. And it's that weakness that makes sense of their discussions and their plans. So there is the plan of invasion. This was not simply a military and naval operation. There was also a great deal of diplomacy at work. Bottom left of this slide, you have a rather interesting comment by a much later writer, Diodorus Siculus. He records, Xerxes, desiring to drive all the Greeks from their homes, sent an embassy to the Carthaginians to urge them to join him in the undertaking and closed an agreement with them to the effect that he would wage war upon the Greeks who lived in Greece, while the Carthaginians should at the same time gather great armaments and subdue those Greeks who lived in Sicily and Italy. So this was a two-prong attack. From the east, the Persians would invade the Greek mainland, and from the west, the Carthaginians would cross over the Mediterranean to reinforce their positions in Sicily, and they would make an attack on the Greek settlements in the western Mediterranean. This would prevent the very wealthy and populous Greek settlements in Italy and Sicily from joining in the defence of Greece. Xerxes has a comprehensive plan of conquest. Continuing with the diplomatic moves, in Sardis, that's before he set out, Xerxes' first act was to send representatives to every place in Greece except Athens and Sparta with a demand for earth and water and a further order to prepare entertainment for him against his coming. This renewed demand for submission was due to his confident belief that the Greeks who had previously refused to comply with the demand of Darius would now be frightened into complying with his own. It was to prove whether or not he was right that he took this step. The reason he didn't send ambassadors to Athens and Sparta, you'll remember, is because when his father Darius did that, the ambassadors were murdered. And this is not something that Xerxes wanted to see repeated. Indeed, there is rather a strange story in Herodotus. The Spartans, who were perhaps not the nicest people, felt rather bad about their mistreatment of the Persian ambassadors back in 490. The Spartans because of this, were unable to obtain favourable signs from their sacrifices, and this caused them deep concern, and they held frequent assemblies at which the question, is there any Spartan who is willing to die for his country, was put by the public crier. At last, two Spartans, Sperkias and Bulis, both men of good family and great wealth, so far as the Spartans were concerned, 
volunteered to offer their lives to Xerxes in atonement for the murder of the ambassadors of Darius. So these two young men were sent off to Persia to suffer whatever fate Xerxes had in mind for them. So they made a long journey all the way to Xerxes in Sardis. And the first thing that happened when they entered the presence of the king was that the men of the royal bodyguard ordered, and indeed attempted to compel them, to bow down to the ground in the act of worship. That is the full prostration. You throw yourself on the ground and bang your head on a carpet. The two Spartans, however, declared that they would never do such a thing, even though the guards should push their heads down on the floor. It was not, they said, the custom in Sparta to worship a mere man like themselves, and it was not for that purpose that they had come to Persia. So they persisted in their refusal, adding words to the following effect. King of the Medes, the Spartans sent us here to suffer punishment in reparation for the murder of the Persian messengers to Sparta. Xerxes, with truly noble generosity, replied that he would not behave like the Spartans, who by murdering the ambassadors of a foreign power had broken the law which all the world holds sacred. He had no intention of doing the very thing for which he blamed them, or by taking reprisals of freeing the Spartans from the burden of their crime. So he sent these two young men home again, unharmed. Something you do get from Herodotus is that Xerxes was a somewhat unreliable king, capable of the most astonishing generosity, and also capable of the greatest brutality. But that is what you expect of Oriental despots, isn't it? Oh, another sign of Xerxes' variable character. There's another representation of him. He probably looked a bit like that. The Greeks had sent spies to Sardis to see how big the army was that Xerxes would send against them. These spies were caught, and they were put to the torture, and then they were to be led off to execution. At this point, Xerxes learned that the Greek spies were in the camp, they'd been caught, and they were to be punished. He immediately had them set at liberty, and he had them conducted around his camp, to be shown the size of the vast forces he had assembled. He had every question answered, everything explained to them, and then he had them sent back, more or less unharmed, to the Greeks, with a full report of the forces that he had assembled against them. Not perhaps the act of an almost insane oriental despot, strikes me as plain common sense. You believe that you have overwhelming superiority, you might as well let the enemy know it, because it might speed up the process of subduing them. I've said that Xerxes planned to get across the Hellespont by building a bridge, and the Hellespont at the point that he wanted to bridge it was seven furlongs wide, that's just under a mile. A bridge of that size had never been built before, but he set some Egyptian and Babylonian craftsmen to work to build a bridge of papyrus and ropes. This was successfully completed, and it was all ready for the army to march across, but then there was a great storm, a storm of great violence, which tore the bridge to pieces, so that when Xerxes arrived, expecting to see a bridge over which he could send his army, all he saw was a few scraps still floating on the shore. Now Xerxes was very angry when he learned of this disaster, and he gave orders that the Hellespont should receive 300 lashes and have a pair of fetters thrown into it. And Herodotus continues, I have heard before now that he also sent people to brand it with hot irons. He certainly instructed the men with the whips to utter as they wielded them the barbarous and presumptuous words, You salt and bitter stream, your master lays this punishment upon you for injuring him, him who never injured you, but Xerxes the king will cross you with or without your permission. No man will sacrifice to you, and you deserve the neglect by your acid and muddy waters. In addition to punishing the Hellespont, 
Xerxes gave orders that the men responsible for building the bridges, the ones that were blown down by the storm, should have their heads cut off. The men who received these invidious orders duly carried them out, and other engineers completed the work. The work completed was a pontoon bridge, a rather makeshift arrangement. Ships from the Persian fleet were moved alongside each other, in a great line across that seven furlongs of water, and across the decks of those ships, a wooden bridge was placed. And across this bridge, between 300 and 500,000 men plus baggage train were marched. It saved a great deal of time, because ferrying that number of people across these waters would have taken a long time, but to march them across, the whole thing could be completed within, I believe, three days. That's the best representation I could generate of the Bridge of Boats. You won't, I'm afraid, see much better than that on the internet. So, although the invasion was held up very briefly by a storm, this was not a substantial delay, and the Persians were able to get their men in good order across the sea from Asia into Europe. The Greek Responses What response could the Greeks make? Remember, the Greeks, they're not a single nation. They don't have a single country. The Greek mainland is divided into a patchwork of often very small city-states. Even if they were all to come together and pool their forces, the Greek forces available to the defence would be one quarter of the size of the Persian navy and one tenth the size of the Persian army. That's even if you deflate the figures given in the ancient historians. The Greeks would not all come together. They would not pool all their forces because many of the Greek city-states looked at the reports of the Persian forces coming against them and surrendered on the spot. Xerxes, on his way from Sardis to the Straits, was met repeatedly by delegations from various Greek cities, all hurrying to present gifts of earth and water. They did not want to try putting up any kind of resistance. However, there were 31 Greek states which decided not to surrender. Most of these were small, most of these were pretty powerless. The most substantial of the Greek city-states, or the Greek states that decided to resist, were the Athenians and the Spartans. They had no choice because Xerxes set out to punish them. He would punish the Athenians as his father had wanted, for their giving of assistance to the Ionian Greeks in their rebellion. He would punish them for the humiliation that they inflicted on his father's forces at Marathon. And he would also punish the Athenians and the Spartans for the murder of his father's ambassadors ten years before. So the two most substantial powers in what is called the League of Corinth, called the League of Corinth because that's where it assembled, were Athens and Sparta. Immediately, arguments broke out. The Athenians decided that because defending Athens was their prime objective, they would not make any arguments over Spartan leadership of either the land or the naval forces, Sparta was not a naval power, but the Spartans said they wanted to be in charge of the naval defence as well as the military defence, so the Athenians gave in at the meetings in the League of Corinth. Leonidas, one of the two Spartan kings, was put in charge of the land forces, that makes sense, and Eurybiades, a Spartan, was put in charge of the naval forces, as I say, the Athenians decided that allowing the Spartans to lead the defence might ensure that the Spartans put all their effort into the defence. Here, however, the first of the big arguments blew up. The Athenians 
had a plan A. Plan A was that the largest Greek army that could be assembled would go north to the mountains around Mount Olympus. There's, northern Greece is very mountainous. And they decided to, that they would take a stand in one of the passes near to Mount Olympus. Again, the idea that the biggest Greek army they could assemble would be able to repel the, the Persians was not uppermost in their minds. What they understood was that Xerxes was working to a timetable, and if they could slow him down in northern Greece, he would not be able to invade central or southern Greece, and in particular, he would not be able to get as far as Athenian territory. However, when they looked at the mountains and the passes in northern Greece, they discovered that there were, too, there were too many alternative routes. There was no point in northern Greece that could be hermetically sealed against a Persian advance. There was no way of forcing the Persians to advance through one pass, which would then be defended for whatever time they could. The Athenians looked and looked, and the next available place where the Persians could be held off by a relatively small force was Thermopylae in the south. And there's a green dot on the map showing Thermopylae. Thermopylae has a number of advantages. It is the only pass. It's a narrow stretch of land between the mountains and the sea, if the Persians want to move from northern into central Greece, they must go through Thermopylae. There is no other way, no other way for getting a large army at least, and the Athenians thought, we'll make a last stand there. That's where we'll mount our defence, we'll send the largest Greek army that we can assemble, it's close to the sea, and we can supply it by sea. We might also be able to provoke the Persians into a naval battle. We think we can win this. If we can destroy the Persian naval power in the Aegean, they might call off the invasion. If we can hold them off for long enough at Thermopylae, they might have to call off the invasion. That is the Athenian strategy. There was plan A to hold the passes around Mount Olympus, when that proved not to be feasible, they fell back on plan B, which was still rather close to Athens, closer to Athens than they'd have liked, but that was the next available place, that was the best stopping point before the Persians could get into southern Greece. The Spartan plan, however, not surprisingly, was that all the Greek forces should fall back to the Isthmus of Corinth, that other green dot in the south. The land bridge connecting those two parts of Greece is less than a mile wide at its narrowest. The Persians would have to pass through the Isthmus of Corinth if they wanted to invade the Peloponnese, which just happened to be controlled by Sparta. And the Spartans were sure that if they dug trenches and if they built other fortifications, they could hold indefinitely. The Athenians pointed out that this was not a very sensible strategy because the Persians were dominant not only on land but on sea. And if they couldn't get past the Spartan line of defence at Corinth, they would simply sail around the Peloponnese until they found a convenient landing spot, and they would invade the Peloponnese by sea, and they would attack the Spartans from behind. But the Spartans, you see, didn't want to send an army out of the Peloponnese. They didn't want to send an army out of the Peloponnese for all sorts of reasons. One of the main reasons was because they were holding down a much larger number of helots, the people who did all the cooking and cleaning and farming, the people who did all the hef heavy lifting, that entire nation of hereditary slaves who were treated very badly, they were frightened that if they sent an army out of the Peloponnese, the helots would rise up against them. 
if they didn't lose against the Persians, they would lose against their own slaves. So the Spartans did not, under any circumstances, want to send an army north of Corinth. They told the Athenians, Thermopylae can't be held. What we must do is plan our main line of defence at Corinth, and because we happen to be in charge of the naval defence as well, Athens and its port, the Piraeus, will be evacuated, and the entire Athenian fleet, or the entire Greek fleet, of which the largest contingent is from Athens, will be moved to Salamis, that rather large island in the Saronic Gulf down there. The Athenians didn't like that. Of course they didn't like it, because it meant that Athens was wide open. There would be no defence of Athens. Indeed, the Spartans did suggest that Athens itself should be evacuated. It was indefensible. There was no point trying to defend it. So the Spartans would not commit their main forces anywhere but at Corinth. They would then defend Sparta and the allies of Sparta. In the course of the discussions, I call them discussions, but it seems the Greek delegates spent most of the time at the League of Corinth screaming at each other, but in the course of the discussions, the Athenians also came up with what they thought the cast-iron excuse of religious festivals. They could not leave the Peloponnese until their religious festivals were over. The feast of the Carnian and the Olympic Games. They were both important festivals, and the Spartans couldn't possibly go to war until those were out of the way. Arguments, arguments, arguments. The Spartans eventually gave in and said, all right, we will fortify Thermopylae, and we will hold Thermopylae against the Persians as long as we can, However, we do have those religious festivals, and they're very important things. We can't allow the mere fact of an overpowering Persian invasion to disrupt our religious festivals. What we will do is we will send a very small force of Spartans, 300 Spartans, along with 900 Helot auxiliaries and some local allies. It wasn't just 300 men, it was several thousand the Spartans agreed that they would send a small force to take up position at Thermopylae and to get it ready for a much larger force to move up there in due course. Here is a map showing the location of Thermopylae. You can see these greeny areas to the south. Those are mountains which the Greeks believed were impassable, you could not get a large army through those mountains. To the north, you have the Gulf of Malia. And so you've got this narrow pass, which, is a, which was, not now, which was about 50 yards wide at its narrowest. Bottom right, you have a photograph of Thermopylae. Because the sea has retreated, you now have a very wide plain between the mountains and the sea. But if you look at the photograph, you can see a Greek road running along the right-hand side, and that is what we believe the ancient shoreline was. So you can see that between the mountains and the sea, there is a very narrow pass, and the Persians must get their three or 500,000 men through that pass, if they are to continue their march on Athens. There was a ruined wall. It was broken down in many places, still substantial in others. There was a ruined wall at the narrowest point in the pass. Leonidas, one of the Spartan kings, led his personal bodyguard of 300 Spartans, plus a larger body of helots and of other allies, up to Thermopylae, and they set about repairing the wall, putting it back into service, building a camp, generally getting ready for when they would be joined by a much more substantial army, which would come up as soon as those religious festivals were over. 
the Athenians also insisted that the Greek navy should be sent north to give naval support to this military defence at Thermopylae. The Spartans weren't happy with it. They dragged their feet. They did their best to make sure that nobody ever went north to Thermopylae. They were absolutely fixed on their Corinthian strategy. They would allow Athens to be taken and burned. They didn't care about the other cities north of the Peloponnese. And they would certainly be rather pleased if Athens ceased to exist. But they would defend the Peloponnese and they would make sure that Sparta got through this war pretty well unscathed. But, as I've said, endless nagging at the League of Corinth caused Leonidas, as a matter of honour, to agree that he would lead his personal bodyguard of 300 men north, and they would wait for the larger Greek army to join them. However, remember that Xerxes was in a hurry. He wasn't just in a hurry because he was in a hurry, though he was. He was also working to that timetable. There was no room for delay. So Xerxes was, in the literal sense, flogging his troops along the roads, along the paths of northern Greece. And the Persians arrived at the Pass of Thermopylae long before the Greeks imagined that they would be able to do so, and they found that they were confronted by a small defence force of just over a thousand men. At this point, let's have a look at the correlation of forces. There are some representations of the Greeks and Persians. On the left, you have a Greek hoplite. You can be assured that they did wear something below the waist, but Greek representations, if they possibly could, would show a willy or two. So this soldier appears to have lost his lower tunic. On the right, you have a Persian soldier. The ceramic paintings on the right give a better impression of them. There is a Greek hoplite in full armour. You can see that he's wearing, I said last week, about a 70 pound weight of wooden, iron and bronze armour. Archaeological excavations around Thermopylae have revealed some of the Spartan skeletons and the Spartans were about 10 stone and they were about 5 foot 6 tall. Every one of them was clothed in this 70 pound weight of armour. It made movement very slow, though of course if you've grown up wearing this stuff and marching up and down and drilling in it, it's rather easier for movement than we would find it. But it does give the advantage of full body defence. That big round shield will protect you from most things. That helmet, you'll have trouble seeing through it, but the helmet is quite useful. And those greaves that protect the lower legs, those are also very useful. And the Greeks had long spears, much longer spears than the Persians had. There, in the bottom right, you have a Persian. And you can see that their entire strategy, all of their tactics, are based on speed, on mobility. You get men on horseback, they dart here, they dart there, they shoot arrows... They then get off and they finish off the enemy that's been largely softened up by volleys of arrows. What they can't achieve in that way, Xerxes will achieve by sheer weight of numbers. Those are the two forces that are about to meet face to face at Thermopylae. And here is what Herodotus says about them. Xerxes sent a man on horseback to ascertain the strength of the Greek force and to observe what the troops were doing. At that moment, the Spartans were stripped for exercise, while others were combing their hair. The Persian spy watched them in astonishment. Back in his own camp, he told Xerxes what he had seen. Xerxes was bewildered. The truth, namely that the Spartans were preparing themselves to die and deal death with all their strength, was beyond his comprehension, and what they were doing seemed to him merely absurd. 
Xerxes did have in his camp a Spartan refugee, a former king of Sparta who had been kicked out in some political intrigue, a man called Demaratus, and Xerxes asked him, what are these people up to? And it's Demaratus who told him they're getting ready to fight. But Xerxes saw how small they were and couldn't understand that they would even consider trying to resist his vast army. Again, back to Herodotus. For four days, Xerxes waited in constant expectation that the Greeks would make good their escape. But the Spartans wouldn't move. They continued exercising, combing their hair, practising their weapons, not at all put out by this immense army that was within sight of them. On the 5th, when they still had made no move and their continual presence seemed more impudent and reckless folly, he was seized with rage and sent forward the Medes and Kissians with orders to take them alive and bring them into his presence. The Medes charged, and in the struggle which ensued, many fell, but others took their places, and in spite of terrible losses, refused to be beaten off. They made it plain to anyone, and not least to the king himself, that he had in his army many men indeed, but few soldiers. All day the battle continued, the Medes, after their rough handling, were at length withdrawn, and their place was taken by Hydarnes and the picked Persian troops, the king's immortals, who advanced to the attack in full confidence of bringing the business to a quick and easy end. But once engaged, they were no more successful than the Medes had been. All went as before, the two armies fighting in a confined space, the Persians using shorter spears than the Greeks and having no advantage from their numbers. Xerxes was watching the battle from where he sat, and it is said that in the course of the attacks, three times in terror for his army, he leapt to his feet. The Persians have arrived at the pass in vast numbers. They greatly outnumber the Greek defence force, this Greek defence force was never intended as the Greek defence force. It was the advance guard, but the Persians had arrived at the pass sooner than anyone expected, and it turned out to be the job of Leonidas, the Spartan king, and his own personal bodyguard to hold the pass, to hold the pass with a larger number of allies. The Spartans realised that they would not get out of this alive. Unless they retreated before the Persians attacked, they would have to stand and fight. And that's what the Spartans decided to do. Towards the end, they sent their allies away to go back south and join in the larger defence of Greece, and they fought on alone. But they fought on ideal ground for defence. It was stony ground. The Persians couldn't use their cavalry. It was also a narrow pass, and the Persians couldn't get around them. And so although there were just a few hundred, let's say under a thousand Greek defenders, and a much, much, much larger of Persians attacking, the Persian numbers couldn't be brought to bear on the Greeks, and the Greeks had better discipline, they had better armour, they had better weapons, and they were able to hold off the Persians day after day. When we spoke about the Spartans a few weeks ago, I gave a rather negative view of them. They were, in many respects, let's say, rather a nasty people. But when it came to fighting, they were about the best in the world at the time. There weren't many of them, but they all knew each other. They all trusted each other. They had all decided that they would hold the Persians off until they were all dead. And that's what they did. They held off the Persians. There's another artificial intelligence generated image of the Persian defence at Thermopylae. It probably looks something like that, though the Spartans would have fought in rather better formation than that. And so, day after day, 
Xerxes sent forward his best troops, and day after day, come evening, those troops were pulled back, and they had suffered horrifying losses. Little by little they were wearing the Spartans down, but the Spartans showed no signs of losing their nerve and turning and running. Every morning the Spartans were there at the ruined wall, ready to march out and to kill the enemy. And it went on and on. There came a point where the Persian forces refused to advance. It was then that the officers took out their lashes and whipped the soldiers forward, forcing them against the Spartan swords and spears. But it was still to no effect. Eventually, by sheer force of numbers, the Persians would wear the Spartans down and be able to press past them, but the Persians were losing valuable time, and to put it mildly, this was embarrassing. So what was Xerxes to do? Well, a stroke of luck. How to deal with the situation, Xerxes had no idea. But just then, a man from Malice, Ephialtes, the son of Eurydamus, came in hope of a rich reward to tell the king about the track which led over the hills to Thermopylae, and thus he was to prove the death of the Greeks who held the pass. And here is a map showing this path. It's a steep and narrow path. It isn't possible to send a whole army over it, but the plan the Persians came up with was that they would send their main force into the pass to engage the Spartans from the front. At the same time, they would send as many men as they could get across this long and steep and narrow path, a goat path, and they would come down on the other side of the pass behind the Spartans and then they would attack them from behind as well as from the front. That was the plan. Ephialtes was given his reward, or he was promised his reward, and he showed the Persians the way along this narrow and mountainous goat path. And here is the end of it. It's one of the more dramatic passages in Herodotus, and Herodotus does bounce from dramatic passage to dramatic passage. There never is a dull page in Herodotus. In the morning, that's the final morning of the battle, Xerxes poured a libation to the rising sun and then waited until the time when the marketplace is filled before he began to move forward. This was according to Ephialtes' instructions, for the way down from the ridge is much shorter and more direct than the long and circuitous ascent. As the Persian army advanced to the assault, the Greeks under Leonidas, knowing that they were going to their deaths, went out into the wider part of the pass, much further than they had done before. In the previous day's fighting, they had been holding the wall and making sorties from behind it into the narrow neck, but now they fought outside the narrows. Many of the barbarians fell, and behind them the company commanders plied their whips indiscriminately, driving the men on. Many fell into the sea and were drowned, and still more were trampled to death by one another. No one could count the number of dead. The Greeks who knew that the enemy were on their way round by the mountain track, and that death was inevitable, put forth all their strength and fought with fury and desperation. By this time most of their spears were broken, and they were killing Persians with their swords. In the course of that fight, Leonidas fell, having fought most gallantly, and many distinguished Spartans with them, their names I've learned, as those of men who deserve to be remembered. Indeed, I have learned the names of all the three hundred. Amongst the Persian dead too were many men of high distinction, including two brothers of Xerxes, Habrukomes and Hyperanthes, sons of Darius by Artani's daughter Frataguni. Artanes, the son of Hytaspes and grandson of Arsamis, was Darius's brother, as Fratuguni was his only child, his giving her to Darius was equivalent to giving him his entire estate. And notice how Herodotus takes time to give names to the brave Persians who fought in that battle. 
Although there's no doubt that Herodotus is on the Greek side, he is a Greek, and he celebrates the Greek victory, he's also aware that the Persians are not absolutely ignoble savages. They are men, like the rest of us, and Herodotus very often treats them with respect and humanity. There was a bitter struggle over the body of Leonidas. Four times the Greeks drove them off, and at last by their valour rescued it. So it went on, until the troops with their fialities were close at hand. And then when the Greeks knew that they had come, the character of the fighting changed. They withdrew again into the narrow neck of the pass, behind the wall, and took up a position in a single compact body, on the little hill at the entrance to the pass where the stone lion in memory of Leonidas stands today. Here they resisted to the last, with their swords if they had them, and if not with their fists and teeth, until the Persians coming on from the front over the ruins of the wall and closing in from behind finally overwhelmed them with arrows and spears. When you look at the Spartans in their domestic arrangements, you are filled with horror. But there is no doubt that when it came to fighting, the Spartans would, let's say, give value for money. There were only 300 of them, but they held off the entire Persian army for the better part of a week. There is a rather dramatic image showing the last stand at the pass. It's another artificial intelligence image. It's not a photograph. There is the modern monument put up, the stone lion put up by the Greeks to celebrate the Spartan last stand, was removed, probably removed sometime in the 5th or 6th centuries AD. The monument that you see today is mid-20th century. Obviously, the Greeks still celebrated as a great victory, and the Greeks at the time celebrated it as a great achievement. But although it is a moral victory, it was a strategic failure. They held up the Persian advance, it says here only three days, it was somewhat longer than that, but they didn't hold up the Persians long enough for them to suffer a shortage of food or any loss of momentum. Even worse than the defeat, because that's what it was, even worse than the defeat at Thermopylae was an inconclusive sea battle at Cape Artemisium. The Greek fleet didn't make any headway against the Persians and had to withdraw towards Salamis. So the Persians resumed their march on Athens. At this point, the Athenians send envoys to Delphi, to the Temple of Apollo, to ask for advice. And the priestess sends a message back which says, you've lost, it's all over, get into your ships and go and find somewhere else to build a city because Athens will fall and be destroyed. When this was reported, the Athenian assembly insisted that envoys should go back to Delphi and should refuse to leave the temple until the priestess gave them a better oracle. The priestess thought about this, and then she told the Athenian envoys that the gods' advice was that they should look to their wooden walls. The envoys took that back to the assembly, which began a long debate as to its meaning. Oracles given at Delphi were not always terribly clear. Many people believed that this was instructions from Apollo that they should fortify the Acropolis with wooden palisades and hold that. Themistocles said, no, it's the fleet. The god wants us to take to the fleet. We'll evacuate Athens, move the entire civilian population across the Saronic Gulf to Aegina, and we'll get ready for a naval battle with the Persians. Debate went on and on. The majority was with Themistocles, but there was a minority which insisted that they could hold the Acropolis and there's the photograph I took of the Acropolis a few months ago. Those are, of course, more recent fortifications, but it is a substantial lump of rock in the middle of Athens, and it can be held. It can be held by a decent force against a less than decent force. So 
A minority of Athenians withdrew to the Acropolis, surrounded it with a wooden palisade and prepared to hold out, as instructed by Apollo. The majority of the Athenians left and were ferried by the Athenian fleet across the water to the island of Aegina. And there in the bottom of the slide you have a representation of Athens as it was somewhat later than the Persian attack. And this is what happened. The Persians found Athens itself abandoned, except for a few people in the temple of Athena Polyas. Temple stewards and needy folk had barricaded the Acropolis against the invaders with planks and timbers. It was partly their poverty which prevented them from seeking shelter in Salamis with the rest, and partly their belief that they had discovered the real meaning of the priestess's oracle, that the wooden wall would not be taken. The wooden wall, in their minds, was not the ships but the barricade, and that would save them. The Athenians, though in imminent and deadly peril, refused to give in or even to listen to the proposals which the support of Hippias, the exiled Athenian tyrant travelling with Xerxes, had given to them. Xerxes wanted a deal. He didn't want to have to fight to take Athens or to take the Acropolis. But the Athenians refused. All their ingenuity was employed in the struggle to defend themselves. Amongst other things, they rolled boulders down the slope upon the enemy as he tried to approach the gates. And for a long time, Xerxes was baffled and unable to take them. But in the end, the Persians solved the problem. A way of access to the Acropolis was found. There's a place in front of the Acropolis, behind the way up to the gates, where the ascent is so steep that no guard was set, and because it was not thought possible that any man would be able to climb it. Here by the shrine of Kekrop's daughter Aglaurus, some soldiers managed to scramble up the precipitous face of the cliff. When the Athenians saw them on the summit, some leapt from the wall to their death, others sought sanctuary in the inner shrine of the temple. But the Persians, who had got up there first, made straight for the gates, flung them open, and slaughtered those in the sanctuary. Having left not one of them alive, they stripped the temple of its treasures and burnt everything on the Acropolis. Xerxes, now absolute master of Athens, dispatched a rider to Susa with news for Artabanus of his success. The Persians destroyed everything on the Acropolis. Afterwards, the rubble was cleared away, the broken statues were buried and used as foundations for later buildings. And there is one of the statues that was recovered from the Acropolis in the 1860s by some German archaeologists. It's the Critias boy, one of the earliest examples of truly representative Greek statuary. You can see that the Persians smashed its arms off, broke one of its legs off, they broke its head off and threw it down. And it was buried and left buried until the 1860s. If you go to the Acropolis Museum, you will see many interesting and beautiful things that the Persians destroyed. And the things that they didn't destroy, they carried off back deep into Persia as, as trophies. The next day, Xerxes summoned to his presence the Athenian exiles who were serving with the Persian forces. The Greeks never had any team spirit. There were many Greeks in the army of invasion and ordered them to go up to the Acropolis and offer sacrifice there according to Athenian usage. Possibly some dream or other had suggested this course to him or perhaps his conscience was uneasy for the burning of the temple. The Athenian exiles did as they were bidden. I mention these details for a particular reason. On the Acropolis there is a spot which is sacred to Erechtheus, who is called the Earthborn, and within it is an olive tree and a spring of salt water. According to the Athenians, they were put there by Poseidon and Athena when they contended for possession of the land as token of their claims to it. Now this olive tree was destroyed by fire together with the rest of the sanctuary. Nevertheless, on the very next day, when the Athenians who were ordered by the king to offer the sacrifice went up to that sacred place, they saw that a new shoot, 18 inches long, had sprung from the stump. 
they told the king of this. So, as far as Xerxes is concerned, it's mission accomplished. He has invaded Greece. He has suffered no substantial resistance. He has taken Athens and he has burned it. Xerxes now takes up residence in the Piraeus, the port of Athens, and he waits for the remaining Greek cities, the remaining Greek states, to send envoys with gifts of earth and water. He's won the war. It's over. But of course it isn't. Oh no, it's not over at all. The Greeks have no intention of surrendering. They've lost Athens, but they still have a good army provided by the Spartans, and they still have that fleet. It hadn't fought particularly well at Cape Artemisium, but there is still a very large Greek fleet in the southern waters of Greece, and it's not over yet. Xerxes waited and waited and waited, and the season went by, and still no Greek envoys turned up, and the Greeks were up to something, and I'll talk about that next week. So that's a brief overview of the first part of the great invasion of Greece in 480 BC. Does anybody have any questions?